Welcome to Popcast Deluxe, your Prove It of Weekly Cultural Review. I'm John Garamonica, critic of the New York Times. I'm Joe Coscarelli, reporter at the New York Times. And Joe, we both, well, we both had a long weekend. Yeah. Uh, but part of that long weekend involved sitting in a movie theater and taking in Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie. This has been the most extraordinary experience of my entire life. to go on a little adventure together and that adventure is going to span 17 years of music how does that sound you were sitting oh <laughs> so uh we had different experiences because i have seen errors tour yes irl yeah you have not i think this is crucial yeah so so i'm curious to know your experience of we can get into the sort of quality of the film in a minute but I wonder what your thoughts are on just Eras Tour. Yeah. Having not encountered it one on one. I've had a busy year. I missed the Eras Tour. Yeah. Um, at the moments when you could have intersected. I could have intersected with it, and I have not been able to see it. Though mm -hmm. I hope that I will on the second leg. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd experienced it online, like mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen clips. I've seen memes. Mm -hmm. I've seen moments. I've seen whole songs even. I watched most of the show right. uh, mm -hmm. the first time around when it existed on YouTube. Yeah. There was like the super cuts, you oh, know, yeah. that yeah, people, yeah. the concert movie basically already Exists. existed in bootleg just like, form. Just like I'm the kid who did the Frank Ocean Coachella movie. There's yes. versions of this out there. Yes. But I will say seeing the high quality Eras Tour film with RPX sound on a, Saturday evening mm -hmm. into Saturday night because yep. this is two hours yeah. and 48 minutes of concert. Saturday evening and Saturday night fall into winter. <laughs> this is just <laughs> an incredibly long stretch of time. Yeah. Uh, I had a great time. Yeah. I had a great time. I didn't know if it was going to drag. I didn't know if I was going to be able to stomach the visual language of yeah. the era story, which we should talk about. Um, <sighs> But what I found was that almost as always, as I find with Taylor Swift, the songs are just good enough to withstand whatever BS swirl around them. So many good songs. It's just even the bad songs are good. That's not true. But uh, <laughs> you and I disagree a lot about what the bad songs are. Yeah. Uh, but I just, yeah, I, 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 I had a blast. Um, uh, to pick up on that thread, I will say the songs that historically I have found challenging, the eras that I have found challenging, were only amplified by being trapped in a chair looking like this at a screen watching essentially Taylor Swift state media. Whew. Yeah, like that was tough. Like the Evermore era, this was incredibly challenging for me personally. A, it was brief. Sure. B, it was spooky. Was Were you a little it? scared as of someone who it's it's October it's as somebody film. who doesn't watch a horror, horror films? Film did you find Willow to be a little bit scary? No, I did not. I thought it was legitimately spooky. Genuinely? Yeah. Okay. Well, then. And that's... well performed. I thought I enjoyed watching the performance of those songs more than I enjoyed watching the performance of them in real life. But part of the reason I enjoyed that is because during that segment specifically was maybe like the first moment of humanity there's that thing where taylor sits at the piano mm -hmm. and starts fiddling with the moss mm -hmm. on the piano mm -hmm. as if it's she's a classic distracted. taylor moment and then really? she does yeah the, like kind of like i'm leaning and, and she's like why am i doing what that? am i doing yeah. like like she's being like a goof. us yeah like us before we start recording yeah. like are we doing this like which what are we saying yeah. leg leg cross right to left left mm -hmm. to right she's doing that it's on stage it's captured they didn't cut it out yep that it's moment, banter. yeah, that moment I really, really enjoyed. Uh, those songs. You're including folklore in this? Folklore is a little bit better. Come on, Betty was a highlight. Betty was great. No, 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 Betty was great. Legitimately great. No, Evermore, though, and especially the fact that Evermore is immediately followed by Reputation, which tells me they know perfectly well Evermore is not hitting. You're talking about Evermore, but what the era that really got short shrift... 
speak now. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's, as, it, it, as if it never happened. It might as well Eradicate, not exist. Literally eradicated from the mem- the cultural memory, which right. is unfortunate. Good album. Yeah, I I don't know. Like what? I, I, okay, so this was my overarching feeling is that, and I sort of said this the first time we talked about the Eras tour. I think there's a lot of recency bias in the set list. Oh, of course, because they're they're touring albums that have not been toured. Yes, which she talks about a little bit in the yes. film. Mm-hmm. But that means that the progress, the arc of the special, of the concert, is wrong. Like, ending with that many Midnight songs instead of a Greatest Hits medley. Of course. Or doing two Midnight songs into Antihero with that as the... Like, Karma as a grand finale. Yeah, Bejeweled skipping and ahead. It's no. just like... Totally agree. It just doesn't work. Like, so much of the emotional catharsis is over by the halfway or two thirds point of the film. Film. And then <laughs> e- everything. And then from there, it's sort of like anticlimax. Yeah. Um, with the Midnight songs, like, you get to Antihero. And, like, I don't love Antihero, but at that but it's moment. A bang- it's like, right. it's a bang. So at that moment, you're like, it's done. And I, I remember feeling the same thing in the room or in the stadium or whatever, like, as it was happening. Like, oh, you're. Uh, I mean, oh, we're doing it's again. a beat traffic. Yeah, doing... It's a beat traffic portion of the show. It like, really if, does if I was at MetLife, yes, but I would have been on my no way to my car. Name one of the fifty thousand people in that stadium who was like, "I'm ready to go." Like everybody was like sticking around to the bitter end. I can name one, but I won't for her health and safety. That is true. We we protect our friends. <laughs> um, so I um yeah, midnight. If anything, this sh- film underscored that midnight's is not hitting. Like broadly speaking. Because by the time, like, look, you want to get me in a stadium for three hours, fanfare, touching the energy of the people around, like, feeling all of that? Okay, I'll grant you a little bejeweled at hour three. Mm-hmm. But in a cinema, mm. sitting in Alamo Draft House, where I you can't... You went to, let's, I mean, let's talk a little bit about I went to Alamo Draft House where you cannot be on your phone, which is why... I took notes on the order cards. <laughs> <laughs> did you order food? I did not order food. I forgot. Like I forgot about this, which is uh, heretical for me. Yeah, I mean, I did. I, the, I have to go back probably just to get these. I did the combo meal. You could go see another movie and just order these. Can you do? Yeah, that? they're at the regular concession stand. Oh. Uh, okay, we've seen the videos going viral this weekend of, of people dancing at the yeah 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 of um, people doing you know um seance <laughs> yeah uh of people losing their minds did that happen at your screening no my screening was a little more grown up i don't know if that was location i saw it downtown manhattan and also what 6 p.m 6 p.m showing okay on a saturday okay so i saw the 2 p.m on saturday i would say mine was like one third to one half kids okay. or kids and parents. Okay. And it also wasn't totally uproarious in the way that some of those videos yeah. are, but I'd say about halfway through, whoever the kids were in like the front two rows were finally like, it's go time. Mask off. Yeah. And absolutely just in the kind of like space between the screen and the front row, just like the whole rest, the whole dancing and singing, dancing, singing, shouting. I could have done with a little more of that. Did it bother you or did it make your experience? No, I actually was kind of like, I I was low key disappointed that there wasn't more of it. Yeah. Also like this respectfully is not a film I need to pay close attention to. I would much rather be immersed in an experience than feel like I have to pay close attention, especially because the closer attention I paid, the more I hated this movie. Like this movie, I mean, Wesley, our colleague Wesley Morris, uh, I thought put it very, very well, where he said the director is, I can't remember the guy's name, it is unclear if he has made a movie or a salad. That I was Wesley's this, line? Yes. I, I honestly found this film visually painful to watch. It doesn't know if it wants to be a thoughtful portrait of a woman commanding a stadium or if it wants to be an absolute, like, the worst hyper MTV micro cut close far middle back fan it's from song to song era to era the pacing is different yes the patience of the camera never kicks in until like after all too well 10 minute version you don't ever feel like you're really watching Taylor until the second half of the film I have these moments very early in the film where all of a sudden 
It's like you're watching Taylor. It's like she's here. She's here. She's up there. She's down there. And then you're like lingering on a random fan for five seconds. And it's like nothing against that fan. But I'm like, are the fans characters? Because if they're characters, are we going to weave them through? Or are we just using them to fill in the spots that we don't have the perfect Taylor shot? I could have done with more fandom. That's what I'm saying. It had to be either less. It had to be less or more. Either ignore them or weave them into the narrative of the film. I have a thing where mass spectacle and especially mass enjoyment uh it triggers an immediate emotional reaction in me like okay. the olympics yeah for instance like a big crowd yeah. and their heart all pushing in one direction mm-hmm. like that immediately gives me chills and yeah. like makes me tear up and wow. so anytime there would be like a full crowd like this the sh- sheer scale of seeing 80 to 100 thousand people all focusing their attention. And I thought they did a really good job underlining the moments where Taylor plays with that dynamic. Yes. Like the pointing that she does at the beginning when she really, you know, is showing how much power she has when she says, when they give her a big standing ovation at one point in between songs. And she says like, that's a, I I forget the exact term, but she says like, that's a really nice thing to do for someone basically, you know, and like plays with the humility versus the like cult leader, uh, divide like I found all of those moments to be really touching and a really good summation of this phenomenon yeah. that is Taylor Swift in mm-hmm. 2023 but you're right it was intermittent and I never knew when we were going to feel those moments versus the quick cuts and the it, and, it, and it did feel like there was some like I thought the movie did a pretty good job covering up the dancing that she got made fun of a lot during the tour right, like because you never lingered on it too much no. like instead of showcasing her dancing it felt like it was obscuring her dancing and, and i will say sometimes emphasizing the dancers which is fine but there's a reason that there are certain things in a stadium show that maybe are so detailed that you miss them and when she was doing the man the facial expressions of the dancers that she's surrounded with, I thought were so intense that I, I found it hard to watch her because I'm just looking at the guy next to her be like. And the one guy does a little like, did you see that I one? <laughs> did, did I just embarrass you? Unbelievable. <laughs> um, the other thing is you're describing the successful parts of the film as essentially extra musical. It's Taylor interacting with the crowds, Taylor pointing at the section and roar and then doing an entire, she's doing a wave, like a a sonic wave throughout the stadium. I didn't really start rooting for Taylor, the singer until all too well. Like, and after that point, I feel like there, the whole thing slows down a little bit. You're sort of invited into a version of Taylor that is not on display in the first half. It's not. It's got nothing to do with her. Like in the in real life, that's not how I experienced the show. I didn't experience. I didn't say the show woke up halfway through. But in this film, it's like there was some urgency to be like, how many different ways can we cut in? How much can we cram in? But I think it fundamentally took away from like, what are we watching? I'm watching one of the premier pop performers of the last ten years at a highly orchestrated stadium show control at a level that maybe only like three to five people can do currently working. I, that's not the movie. That's the movie that I would have liked to have seen. That is not the movie that this was. I got that. I got the idea. As it's someone like if the movie is for eight year olds, then that's fine because I'm sure the eight year old sitting next to me wasn't sitting there being like, ah, it's got the edits and the it's too fast. But for me, having seen the concert and also fundamentally being sympathetic to Taylor as a performer, I wanted a little bit more breathing space. See, I felt like I understood her mastery of performance and of the stage. I thought musically, I mean, because it was so seamless, the rendition of the show, like Mm -hmm. because any sort of flub is covered up or edited around or cut entirely like i do wonder the songs that were cut were they cut because because there was an off moment or were they cut because she thinks they're the least uh crucial to the story she's telling Mm -hmm. um so i did feel like even though it was so smooth in its delivery i didn't doubt for a second that she was owning the performance and i thought everything sounded great 
Um, shout out to my guy with the John and Kate plus eight hair, uh, the guitar oh, player. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the band leader. Yeah, well. I mean, he's been he's, around since the beginning. I was going to say, you, you can see watching the movie, you're like, that guy's been around since the beginning. Yeah. Otherwise... He might uh, be styled a little differently. <laughs> you mean the haircuts grandfathered in? Is yes. that just... To I be honest, it's that. a lot more chill than it used to be. <laughs> like in like 2010 or yeah, whatever. Yeah, we need the si- side by side. Like it was a wilding. Real Rascal Flats vibes. Yeah. Um, I liked seeing the band. I would have liked to see even more. Um, but mostly like, and this is, this shows my bias as a Taylor fan. And like, okay, Reputation, good songs. Like that was a nice little portion of the Great show. Songs. But like all of my favorite moments in the movie were her with an acoustic guitar or a piano like oh, those that's interesting. like our song incredible great. our song was great uh i'm just like blown away every time that like a teenager mm-hmm. could wrote do that, that yep. you know mm-hmm. um all too well oh fascinating really really great I just, I just refuse to buy that the 10 minute version is the canonical version. It's just oh my God. still not there for ch- me. I got chills. At the extended verses? I got chills. I'm not even gonna lie. I got chills. And I really I I understand, <sighs> but like to me, the extended version, uh it's uh, okay, here's the thing. It doesn't diminish the song. And in places, it strengthens it. Are there more, like, <sighs> lully moments? There's probably more lully moments, like, percent to total. But if anything, I think it thickens and deepens the song. And I really, maybe, <sighs> look, maybe after 90 minutes. the of, outro. Maybe after 90 minutes of, like, seizure editing, I was ready to just have someone, like, live hold a camera yeah. on someone and, like, look at a thing without being told, like, stop, stop looking at that thing. You're not allowed to look at it that much. Um, but genuinely chills. And I really also felt like, look, Taylor is like 10 to 20, 20 to 30% like Broadway theatrical in her sure. performing. Yeah. Maybe more sometimes, yeah. but like, let's generously. This tour, it's, well, it's part. At yes, an all time high. But like, that's a moment where I said, ah, no, 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 no. I know this Taylor show. I mean, I feel like we're always going to be talking about Taylor in relationship to Drake or whatever, but like. You think of like the recent Drake album, the moments that to me that really stood out are the moments that really felt like 09, 2010, 2011. The grounded w- stuff. Yeah, wounded, detailed, uh, solipsistic, et cetera. Um, that, that Taylor has a version of that too. And seeing the camera like hold still on her, relatively speaking, after all the kind of frenetic stuff earlier was a relief to me. And not like I need to only see the version of Taylor that I prefer, but I di- I did find it even like cinematically, it served her better and it felt better to watch. Yeah, and that's why like I you know I I fight against my own impulse, which is like old Taylor is the Taylor to of watch, course. but like the Fearless section, I thought incredible, Fla- like flawless. Yeah, like genuinely could have watched. 90 minutes just a fearless. I mean, this part, I think, is where Eros works, is you can really feel where the pivot moments are in her career and in the songs. Uh, and and like you say, like the move from the specificity of some of the earlier work to the, you know, like the 1989 part, like I get it. It felt climactic. It felt exciting. Yeah. But it also felt like these songs sacrifice something. And I thought the the fact that the more intimate music worked on such a grand scale almost undermined the need for Midnight's, which I think like you and I both thought about as an album written in part because the two albums she made during the pandemic wouldn't play in a football stadium. And, and frankly, yet, but and I think that was borne out to be fair. I see, I disagree. Like, I thought those ones Betty. worked. I mean, you, I thought I August re- worked. Like, I thought I could. I thought my tears ricochet worked. Uh okay. Betty, the last great American dynasty, to me, good, well paired, back to back. Thought that was, uh, it has a a rhythmic vitality that I think you need in this kind of setting. Right. There's a beat. Yes, but like the one. No. Sure. On the roof. Fine. All the. I mean. Fine. All those songs killed it. Fine. I it's fine. More, I found myself more sympathetic to folklore, 
leaving this this film than I historically. Okay, have that's been. what I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yes. not what you said at the beginning of the episode. No, I, <laughs> not, I don't. Evermore to me, Evermore is. What songs did she play from Evermore? She did Willow, Willow, Marjorie, Champagne Problems, Tolerated. I agree. Look, Champagne I agree. Problems, I thought was okay. Those were not my choices mm-hmm. from that album. And and this is the thing: following Fearless album and in front of Reputation. I mean, this to me is an implicit uh, admission of defeat. That's a bathroom break. It really. This is this just letting people know, like, I, I know we got to do this. It's like, but then why four kind of... Evermore songs and one Speak Now song? I... <laughs> why? Come, come tell us. <laughs> we we want to know. That's where I'm talking about recency bias. So it's just like, of course, Evermore songs have never been toured. But to me, you could have done, and I think this was one that was cut from the film. Like, could have done "Tis the Damn Season," which at least has some mm-hmm. some drive to it. You mm-hmm. know, uh, I I really. I mean, I guess the thing that I was surprised by was seeing those songs live is like, look, I know they're I know they're duds, like respectfully, like they're duds, but like they're not duds to fifty five to seventy five thousand people, and so that's helpful for me to see. I'm glad to watch it. I'm glad to know that people are connecting with those songs. I don't connect with them, but obviously people connect with them. So if she wants to play five of them and seven midnight songs. They're in the same way last week. The If you're 18 or 20, you're Drake is Drake. And if you're 25, you're Drake. It's like same thing with Taylor. Totally same thing. Okay. So the visual palette <laughs> of this film. Okay. I've long had a joke, a bit, that it's like if Taylor had good visual aesthetics, she'd be too powerful. Like it's actually like thank God that she's never made like an amazing music video. Uh, or put on or or a great album cover or yeah I don't know if you saw like going around on Twitter recently for in like a couple different contexts like the Taylor dance moves in the delicate video okay. which just like the kind of like real like angular and awkward and unbalanced I don't know I think obviously because people are now seeing her on a big screen and then kind of like harking back to classic awkward Taylor dancing yeah I'm not talking so much about the awkward dancing as I am about the rainbows and the dresses yeah, yeah, and the cabin and the, you know, just like this stuff. Broadway. Yeah, it's very Broadway. Yeah. And that's something that I'm quite allergic to. Mm-hmm. Um, I but dis- I dislike the, the, but the no bigger, no bigger star has worse merch. The song is literally cold, gold rush. And you chose a disgusting, muddy, dusty, dirty, frankly, hideous colors. And, and this is. Mm-hmm. All all part of what I'm saying, which is like if if Taylor had a more a sharper visual eye or mm-hmm. taste, I for a while I thought, hmm, she'd be too powerful. She'd be the most dominant artist of all time. I and think I now, see I, think I know where you're going. Yeah. And now it has been suggested to me and I've come to on my own. It's yep. like, no, in fact, this yes. the corniness That's of this look what makes it big. is what makes it big. And most people don't agree with me. And no, I'm in course. the minority, yeah. not the majority. No, that's absolutely right. Because if she was an esteete, she would be uh, inaccessible. Yes. So she's not an esteete, so she's an access- so she's accessible. But the look of this stuff, I'm just like, and I've seen Taylor tours before. I've seen the singing in the rain bits. Yeah, of course. You know, I've seen the, the toler. I mean, the tolerated one is a great example, which like there's a lot of jokes online, like, oh, this is cinema when she sits down at the That's- at the long table, and then the backup dancer comes and they make faces at each other. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I okay, and I thought that it would be I wish harder. One of water glasses was empty, so, so you I could, could just sling it. Yeah. I thought it would be harder for me to sit through because I find it so cringe, just the the look oh. of all this stuff. But I'm just like, I was in it. I was in no. it. I was in it. I was just like, it's like it did not. It did not take away from my enjoyment of the music, which I guess is how I feel about her whole career. It's just like, no matter how bad it looks, like I, you know, I think of some of the old music videos, you know, like uh, White Horse. When she's doing White Horse and she's really like, just like the most melodrama. Like, mm-hmm. I think back on all these, you know, wildest dreams, even like, and I'm just like, man, like, do you remember when she shot a video in Africa for Wildest Dreams? <laughs> Like, 
just like, what are we doing here? And yet, like, I'm just like, like, that's, that's, that's my cousin. You know what I mean? Like, ah, like you can't, you can't hold that against them. Like, it's like, it's, it feels like. I can't wait till like the, the, like the pop crave tweet of like, today is the 13th anniversary of <laughs> Taylor Swift going to Africa to film the wildest dreams video. Like. Uh, but what did you, yeah, what did you, what did you make of letting this all wash over you at like such a scale? Because like, also like she, like her, her physicality on screen was great. Like, yeah, her that's why looming. I wanted to, that's why I felt so kind of like offended by the editing and directorial choices here because like I've been following Taylor, writing about Taylor, thinking about Taylor for 15 years at this point. Like, and I feel like the person who, made these choices or the people who made these choices were like actively working against her. It was, it was, I felt like it was like at war. The film was at war with Taylor. And you feel and that, that was, in like the costuming and the choreography as well? No, no, no. Just no. the That's direction. Just of the, the direction and editing. Look, costuming and choreography. Look, I'm, I've a long since, I've long since accepted that I do not enjoy those aspects of the performance, but I'm not offended and I'm not offended by them anymore. I don't, uh, as they say, I don't rate them at all. Like, I think that they are clunky. I think that they are. This great is actually good. Honestly, great cup. This is good. Yeah. yeah. This, is this is as good as it gets. Um, one thing I will say is that the other thing that I was really struck by, and actually I found probably as distracting as maybe you find the sets or the outfits, the smiles. Mm. The smiles. Hers? No, the band. Yeah. The backup singers, right. the dancers, relentless, yeah. relentless smiling, yeah. unbearable smiling. Like, and I understand it's like you're communicating. Sure. You're, pl- you're playing to the cheap seats. Yeah. And also it's like you're playing to the cheap seats and you're playing to the cameras. Yeah. But um, not all of these songs are smile songs, obviously. And look, I'm not going to say that there aren't moments where the happy song lines up with the smiling backup dancer. But I felt like there were so many moments where I kind of caught someone being like, and I was like, this isn't exactly right for the tone of what's happening musically. And I was, it made me think about what is the Taylor live value proposition? Like what are people going there for? And I feel like they're going there for, even if the songs are sad, even if you're connecting to a heartbreak song, even if you're connecting to one of the, downer uh, tracks in the catalog, you're there to connect with it in a communion way. Yes. And that communion with the other tens of thousands of people, with Taylor herself, that is a source of relief, of sucker. That's, you know what I mean? Like, that's that's where that smile makes sense. I found it a little distracting because there were a number of moments where I was like in my feels about a certain song or at a certain lyrical moment. And then you catch someone on screen being like, and I was like, uh, uh. but by and large, I think most fans, even at the darkest moments are showing up because they think that they can achieve or be brought to that place through the dark songs. What moment brought you to that place? To the smile place or to the dark place? Either. Where, what, where, when were you feeling the most? In a surprising way, or, or in a way that you were, you were leading up to, uh, anticipating. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm looking at the set list right now. You belong with me. Is astonishing. Remains astonishing. Um, I thought the performance of it was so, so pure. Uh. And you really hear, like, even a mature, older Taylor still sounds great delivering that. You Belong With Me, I thought was incredible. Look what you made me do. Wow. I just was like, let's let's go. Can I tell you the truth? Yeah. I I went to the bathroom. (laughs) Unbelievable. I saw, like, the whole reputation there? No, no. Just, I saw, like, half of Look What You Made Me Do. Wow. I'm like, I still don't like this song terrible choice like enchanted comes right after that and it makes it clear how bad enchanted remains i prefer it unbelievable um uh, and i also prefer ready for it i thought ready for it was a ready highlight. for it was also great yeah, yeah yeah even the most attitudinal taylor songs are rarely actually attitudinal yes and look what you made me do is like a genuinely truly attitudinal taylor song and i thought that she leaned into it i was really really grateful for that blank space 
Mm. Blank Space was really good. With the fake bashing of the car. And, it, and an interesting <laughs> like, thing. Why is she holding a golf club on top of this giant lit up cube? From Wimby was where I was sitting slash standing um, during the show when I was there. I saw that whole thing, but it didn't quite register that every time they hit the car, there was dented. a dented. Yeah. I didn't. It, maybe I just didn't have the right angle. As a on throwback it. to the music video. Yeah, but I just like didn't realize that that's what was one happening of her better on the music screen. videos. Good, as we've been slandering her music videos. Definitely a good music video. But I was like happy to see that additional detail in the film. Um, yeah, to me, uh, those were probably the highlights. What about you? I've gone through most of my highlights. Can't I you think went to the bathroom during. The- <laughs> Unbelievable. Absolute madness. I don't have that much use for the late period singles until Antihero, really. Um the you <laughs> the moment that you had uh with You Belong with Me, I think I had during Love Story, which is yeah. just like I'm still I'm always trying to find a way to make that not the defining Taylor Swift song like yeah. in my head. And then you get some distance from it and you see it sort of like in a broader context. Uh, and I'm like, man, it's just really hard to argue against this as mm-hmm. like, like, I feel like that song will be like, we think of Frank Sinatra songs, mm-hmm. like, you know, nearing a century later. Yeah, of course. Like, I think that that, that, that one's just when gonna... we're doing Popcast deluxe in 21, 20. Yeah. It's like, it's just going to last, it's just yeah. going to last forever, whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. And I've re- that really set in while watching it. Yeah. By and large, before we before we go to the next segment, would you recommend this to a, a person who has not seen the Taylor tour? I would. I think that, you know, in my day to day life, I still get a lot of so what's the deal with Taylor Swift questions. Like, like literally, yeah, like every day, every day, literally every and day. And it's come back around like it's one anecdotal way to register the level of fame that she has at this moment is like. You know, an old person might ask me, a child might ask me, a 20 something might ask. You're out here speaking to old people and children every now and then. Wow. Uh, I try to keep my, try to keep my, um, my conversational range wide. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Do you think they're all watching old people (laughs) and children? Please. (laughs) Um, and I do think like for even the most skeptical among us, I think this movie would draw people in. I do think it's a little long for a non fan, but I think even if you, you know, I don't know if people still do this, but like if you want to, if you're seeing another movie and you're a little early and you just want to pop in for 15 minutes of the Aristor film, uh, I recommend it because I do think it answers a lot of questions just to see the, the sheer scale of it and also just to hear some of these songs where you're just like, oh man, like these are undeniable. I guess if I'm going to, if there is a canonical Taylor cinematic experience it is probably like the folklore sessions long pond yeah like to me and and about an album i don't even like that much but i think is a frankly much more on the nose and revealing piece of work about this particular person i'm also really curious you know beyonce is doing a renaissance tour film yep at any point they could close their eyes and be right back there and take it with them uh, Beyonce was gracious enough to show up at the opening night. Uh, yeah, at the and premiere. I was googling like, is this AI? Yeah. <laughs> like, is the, like, is this Photoshop? Is this AI? And um, yeah, it appears that Beyonce was there, um, along uh, with our podcast deluxe guest, Marin Morris. Oh yeah, Marin Morris live at the Grove with um, Beyonce and Taylor. And so it makes me wonder what can Beyonce do with a similar format right. in a relatively similar period of time. If anything, I am I would venture to guess it's going to be a lot more uh, of a mercenary edit, like a lot more military precise. I mean, and the other thing that Beyonce does is whisper hushed poetry over backstage and family footage, which we didn't have at all in the Taylor. No, movie. no, no. But like, I'm curious. I, but I think even if Beyonce keeps it purely stage. I have a feeling it's going to be uh, a better cinematic experience. That's my guess. All right. But we'll revisit it. We'll be back. Because that's going to be a show that I didn't see that I'll be curious. You know, I did not get to see Renaissance Store, unfortunately. A couple weeks, we'll be back. Yeah. The other major musical event of the weekend? New Bad Bunny album, Nadie Sabe, surprise released on Friday. Quote, unquote, those who know, know. Do you want me to test out my Spanish and do the whole title? Go for it. Nadie Sabe Lo Que Va A Pasar Mañana. What? 
Not bad. You did it. Yeah. Uh, oh. No one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. That's true. This album was surpri- like surprise, you know, maybe five days before. One of these surprises that gets hinted at over yeah. and over again and for like, like two months. Like we also knew, like obviously not like we're some geniuses. No, I like, think Bad Bunny fans knew. Yeah. yeah people knew. Um, so this is and, and it's interesting that this album comes exactly on the heels of the Drake album. Because I think it couldn't be more similar. That's what I'm saying. I mean, like these are two stars. I wouldn't say at exactly the same stages of their careers, but who are trying to solve a similar problem and are ultimately finding similar solutions to that problem. This is a a long album. This is an album that returns to an early style of Bad Bunny uh, lyrical approach and and production selection. It's much more sort of like trap and like hip hoppy yep. than a lot of the later stuff. Um, I found myself, the more I listened to it, increasingly sympathetic to the songs, yep. decreasingly sympathetic to the kind of uh, the approach. It's fatiguing, and I just felt like one of the things that Bad Bunny has historically been so good at is trying new genres, yeah. trying new styles, trying new flows. I mean, again, this is a Drake thing of like, hey, I wonder what it would be like if I did an emo record. I wonder if I, a pop punk record. I wonder what it would be like if I did like a straight hip hop record. I wonder if I work with uh, Natanel Cano and do like a, a sort of Corridos Tumbados record. Like this is the thing that Bad Bunny is like one of the best at. Yeah. This feels like a little bit of a retreat and saying, what's like the most comfortable, fastest return to form that I can do? Should we listen to? I mean, don't want to do the first song because it's very long. It's very long, but it's like a it's a setting the tone. It's a yeah, state it's of the a, union address. It's a Drake song. Yes. Yeah. But um, should we listen to Monaco? Yeah, I want to talk about Monaco. So okay, let's so let's listen to a little bit of Monaco. Yes. Watch I, some of the video. Yes. <laughs> Dima. 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 Esto es lo que tú querías. Yo soy fino, esto es trap de galería. Tú eres un charro, Rocky de aquí, una porquería. Yo un campeón, Rocky Marciano, Rocky Balboa, Rocky Balbía. Tengo la ruta, tengo la vía, sí, tengo la vía. Los gastos de noche facturo todo el día. What do you got? I think everything about this Bad Bunny album is contained In within this. the video specifically. For okay, Monica. I have not watched the video. Okay. So talk me through it. He shows up at Carbone. <laughs> okay. Well, th- thanks for watching. Bob. And Al Pacino is there. Great. <laughs> and then randomly, he's posing with the Red Bull F1 car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In Monaco. Of course. Uh, and it's just basically, to me, it's like, okay, you're Bad Bunny in 2023. You're supposed to be taking the year off. But suddenly, everything in the universe is available to you yeah. from... Jersey Club beats to Kendall Jenner uh, and Al Pacino and Spicy Rigatoni. And you're just like, I'll have all of it, (laughs) you know? Uh, And it's, it's a victory lap. It's a good song. I have like, I like this song. It's going to be a smash. I have one of the better songs. I have no doubt. Um, Great orchestral sample, uh, some fun rapping, um, but just like, yeah, like, let me just, let me just put Al Pacino in, a semi meaningless video and I'll also pose on the best F1 car of all time. Like right. just like, cause why not? Why not? Yeah. And that's how this whole album feels to me. Um, although, uh, lyrically and our, our colleague JP pointed this out lyrically, a lot of this album is like, Oh, fame. fame. I mean, uh, the bad bunnies lyrics do not get, dissected on the level of drake right part because of the language the yes. language barrier mm-hmm. um obviously a lot of people write and think about bad bunny who speaks spanish mm-hmm. but in the english language press and on it's social media it's not dissected the same way mm-hmm. but like he's pissy yeah you run uh, you know if you're if you're if you're curious run it through google translate yeah i mean uh, the the english translation is great they, he also i don't know if you caught this um he has a line where he's like I could be by. 
Oh, uh, I didn't catch he has that. Basically, the, the same Drake line. line. Drake, yeah, like it's not exactly the same joke, but like it's almost there. Um, so yeah, I look. I think yeah, Bad Bunny is going through it. He does not love fame. Which no, is something I mean that, you know, literally, there's a song called "Gracias por Nada." Yeah, like, li- yeah. like, I'm just like yeah. he's just letting you know. Um, I will say like. Um, the back half of the record, much like the Drake album, the back half of the record, when some of the genre experimentation kind of kicks in, I was like, oh, like, and this is like where she goes, which is a single, which was a single from maybe like a month yeah, ago or a month and a half the ago. Jersey Club one. It's the Jersey Club record. We should listen to a little bit of that. <laughs> And then there's Thunder and Lightning, which is with Eladio Carrion, who's a Puerto Rican rapper. Uh, and the back half of that is a drill record. Little sprinkles of drill throughout this album. Yeah, yeah. and so I, I was listening to that song, and I was like, huh, okay, well, you still want a piece. You clearly want a piece of that. Yeah. And I wonder if this album, even this subject matter, might have been more fascinating if it wasn't kind of like a, a essentially, frankly, it's a Spotify core album. Yeah. Not to invoke Popcast circa 2018, but this is a Spotify core album. Or it's a mixtape. Yes, but it's a mixtape in the like in a Spotify era. Yes, it's a mixtape in a Spotify era, and it has that like the way that his vocals are produced combined with the the specific it's like these are like hip hop or hip hop adjacent beats but they're not they're they're woozy yeah they're like that and so the way that much of this album especially the first 10 songs kind of like bleed together i mean this is i mean this could be a post malone record on some level and so you know is it a is it as good as the previous Bad Bunny breakout albums? Like I don't think it's as good. Even if I like the songs, it doesn't tell me a lot about him. It tells me here's a person who is I don't want to say stagnating, but here's a person who has maybe run out of runway on all the things that he's done so far and is taking some kind of spiritual breather to say, "Hey, lyrically, hey, I'm kind of over this or I need a path out." And the way that I'm expressing that in words is by saying it and in production choices by going back to a very, very, very old comfort zone. This is a little bit worrying to me in general, which is that we only have so many superstars and it feels like you can reach that level fairly quickly now. Bad Mm -hmm. Bunny is among the last to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would put Olivia Rodrigo in that camp. On the hip hop side, I, th- I think of people like Twenty One Savage and Lil Baby, who s- are smaller artists but command that sort of um, level of oxygen within their sphere. And I do wonder what we do with these people when they peak. I feel like they often we love when they're working their way up and they're they're fighting against something and they're pushing back and they're. On the you're saying that all that you're like the entire uh are you suggesting the entire framework of contemporary stardom is the rise yes and, and that then, there's not anything after that and i think you see it from the artists and their frustration and their inability to to push past once they reach the summit and i think you see it in the fatigue from fans and yet i feel like you know bad bunny said he was going to take this year off he couldn't quite do it because you always, and you see the same thing in Drake. You see it in Taylor's omnipresence. Yeah. And things move They can't fast. quite ever leave really the game. leave the game enough. And they're always like, but don't forget about me, but don't forget about me. And yet the thing that they're s- delivering in order to be remembered mm-hmm. is not at that level. And just, there's just a, it's just content fatigue. Yeah, I mean, and it's again, spanning I'm, all of music, and, and I, especially I, at the superstar level. Um, I don't remember if this was in an interview you did, but it was with either Coach K or P from Corn QC talking about 
their release strategy, whoever it was, expressed is that it's not like you're releasing songs and hoping that you get on a radio playlist. It's that every week there's a new Spotify new music playlist, Apple new music playlist, there's a new hip hop playlist, there's a new R&B playlist. There, there are now untold holes to fill. And it is their job to release enough music to fill those holes. Yeah. And I imagine more if you are, more. And if you are Bad Bunny, and you know every time you put something out, you're going to have a platform. You're going to be amplified by these platforms. And then you go a week, a month, three months, six months without. And you see, you know what? Those platforms, they continue. Those platforms don't love me. I'm useful for them. But there's going to be a Spotify New Music Friday whether or not I put out new music on Friday. There's going to be a Spotify hip hop playlist, whether or not I do it. There's going to be, and there's got to be some tug in the back. I would, on the back of the mind, I would think that's like, should I let someone else cook? Yeah. And How there long are plenty can of, I wait? And also, like with, you know, the way that Spanish language music is moving in America right now, whether it's you know Peso Pluma or bizarre rap com, uh, uh, collaborations, like it, it's not the the pipeline is much wider now. And I think it's creating opportunities for all kinds of music to be heard that weren't really being heard, certainly not five to ten years ago, but even like two to three years ago. And Bad Bunny is to thank, I think, for a lot of that. Bad Bunny is to thank. Does that mean that he wants to grandfather out and just, like, walk away? Or is he still like, nah, I still got some game in me? I don't know. He's also hosting SNL. To be able to host SNL at this point is an incredible, like, step and achievement. Yeah, and he's diversified so much so quickly. You know, he's, mm-hmm. he's in movies. He's doing the wrestling thing. He's dating a Jenner. Um, and sometimes it feels like an artist at that level is checking the box when it comes to putting out music. At the mm-hmm. same time, it's like, similarly to the Drake album, it's like, out of 20 odd bad bunny songs there's going to be a lot of pretty be... good songs and i'm grateful for them as a fan mm-hmm. uh, but narratively i think there's a struggle all right before we go to the question of the week uh do you find it odd that he's sampling madonna's vogue on this album look i mean this is where we're it's, at it's like, literally it, it this is like the too big to fail yeah. era where it's just like what's the biggest hit and it's not simply like what's a big hit in like the jack harlow fergie sense like what's like audacious but not philosophically sound is yeah, there a word for that just like it's, it's like that i said about the monaco it's video just, pure it's just flex. because i can pure flex pure flex pure flex you want to go out on a maybe more appealing song yeah i mean the other thing that he's doing um which our stars do when they reach a certain yep. level is they collaborate widely and yep. they bring up young talent putting people on um so you know you have the grupo frontero record from earlier this year mm-hmm. that he did um and then on this he has some latin trap artists that he's bringing uh i thought the verse from young miko mm-hmm. uh who i hadn't really heard before i think yeah. maybe in passing on a playlist or something um on what i believe is like the third track called yeah, Fina. Really... i thought that i thought it was a strong verse and a yeah. really nice showcase uh up early on a blockbuster album right. for an artist on the rise miko ay miko ay Speaking of artists on the rise, <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> From a reader. A reader. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, I've got questions. Sorry. From a, a viewer. A viewer. From a listener and a viewer. Please. Do you see what we... We're on camera. Yeah, yeah. Watch Popcast Deluxe on YouTube. So, you do realize we're on camera, right? Yes. It's a viewer. Sometimes. It's- I like to forget. I like to zone out like I'm Adonis in the booth. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, so the subject, uh, this is from two weeks ago, just for clarity. So a lot has happened. A lot has happened in, in the Adonis Graham universe in the last couple of weeks. But this is perhaps prescient uh, yeah. in anticipating this. This is from Sasha. Uh, uh, Sasha says, Drake's new video intro features Adonis speaking about his painting he did that Drake used for his album cover. Talk about how much how much money you got for your beautiful drawing. Oh, please. Is this a brilliant move to bake in some art usage fees that could begin to feed a retirement account for young Adonis? I, I should say I'm pretty sure Adonis 
probably it's already has, good. It already has a retirement account. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he needs like the royalties off of this artwork. Just, but but that's fine. But I, I appreciate the spirit. Sasha says, I am a current art education grad student at Brooklyn College. We salute that. Uh, and we recently learned about the stage of drawing that Adonis shows. Impressively, Drake speaking to his son is a textbook example of how a parent should be engaging with their child about art. Be inquisitive more than complimentary. The rub is when he asks if he wants to talk about how much he got paid for the art. In Jennifer Egan's, this, this is incredible. This question, incredible. There's so many pivots Swerves. in this question. Uh, in Jennifer Egan's pair of novels, A Visit from the Goon Squad slash The Candy House, first of all, Jennifer Egan, come on Popcast Deluxe. Uh, she weaves a tale of a near future music industry based around children responding to and engaging with music on iPads as the driving factor in the music business. That's just reality. That's actually not futuristic at all. That's <laughs> yeah. just real. Green anyway, Spot came out a while ago. That's fine. Uh, did Drake begin a trend of bringing his child's art into the product? Is this any different than Blue Ivy, who is phenomenal at dancing, which could likely lead to a career in the performing arts? And how much for the Adonis original Goat Daddy at Christie's if Drake decides to auction it? This was big news to, to me that this was a goat and not a dog. I, I still think it's a dog. <laughs> you, I'm sorry. You, you think death of the artist? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. The author. Like, yeah. Adonis doesn't get to decide no, what this animal is a, it is. This is a dog. <laughs> this is a dog. I regret to inform everybody. So since this question. A de- how, also, like, we're back to back, like, demonic goat yeah. last week. Demonic, oh, like, yeah. okay, it was a lot. The lot there, this thing brought up a lot of energy. It's in the air, yeah. yeah. Um, Adonis was featured on the album. Mm-hmm. Gets a little bit of a verse. And then Drake, as we heard across this album, shortening verses from Chief Keef and seemingly Sexy Red, also shortened the verse from his very his own, own son, child. Uh, but has since released it as the Adonis freestyle. My man freestyle. The my man freestyle. Yeah. Don't talk to my man like that. I like it when you like it. My, 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 my man. My, 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 my man. Um... Okay. Big week. Celebrity children. Yeah. So let's talk about Blue Ivy. There was also a clip of, I believe, Madonna's daughter voguing on yeah, stage. Yeah, Madonna, two of Madonna's kids at least, I think, showed up yep. at the debut of her tour in London. And were voguing on stage. On stage. Um, I think, if I had to guess, the kind of, the way that stardom functions now, like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of quaint to think about four years ago, story of Addie Don, like, Drake hiding, or three years ago, whatever, is like Drake hiding his child. Yep. How unviable that is in like the contemporary star making ecosystem. Like you think about what happened with Sexy Red, like just in the last like week or right. something, just everything is up for dissection. Everything is available. Everything is put out. Um, so the idea that anybody has secrets anymore feels like gone. And what I think that also has meant is this kind of collapsing of traditional boundaries between like things I'm doing for myself or my family or my personal life and things I'm doing for my professional life. And I think increasingly someone like Beyonce, like Blue Ivy is like a part of the Beyonce narrative. And the tour. Yes. Literally. Well, literally, yeah. yes. Uh, but I'm saying what's happening on tour yes. is like the manifestation. Yeah. It's like the final form of something that's been happening for years at this point. You can say this even abstractly about Kanye and Kanye. I was going to say this is all the Kardashian. This is Kim and North of yes. culture. Yes, um, it's the Kim and North TikTok, which is implicitly Kanye content, even though it's not Kanye's not involved in it. Yes, I'm blind, blind, blind. Did it surprise you that Drake has found a way to make content out of Adonis? I mean, he's a really cute kid. Sure, very cute. And they've been making basketball content for years, so it That's only makes th- sense that There's, the music content would follow. Is there anything that art, feels the visual icky. Art. Is there anything that feels icky to you about it? I I can't like it, we're too far down the road. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not with Drake specifically, but with Nepo babies and like they now we're talking literal babies. Uh, and I just think this is yeah. The uh, we want. 24 hour a day, seven day a week reality television from all of our most famous performers. And also if it's being reinforced to you that the thing that people are connecting with you on is access to your personal, your personal self, even someone like Drake, who's always done an incredible job of finding ways to, um, uh, 
creatively distill things that happen in real life and make art from them that is separate from the real life. Like Drake is not tabloid messy in the classic way that I think of like 2000s era tabloid messy stars. He's not, or if he is, it's not as publicly visible. Maybe it's living more in like Stan accounts and comments and yeah. stuff. And, and it's, it's blowing up the lives of private citizens. Yes, Usually literally. like when you put when people find out who the girl is that he's rapping about. Like yeah. Kiki, with like 8,000 followers on Instagram yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, but Drake has historically not done it that way, yeah. but obviously understands that the demand for for content and subject matter of that nature is very high. And so because of that, why wouldn't he take his son and put it into play? Adonis' mother, also a great artist. That's, let's, that's get her, let's get her paintings should, moving. Yeah, should we throw a Sophie yeah, Brousseau up? Some Sophie Brousseau. Yeah, throw a Sophie Kills. Brousseau up, like, yeah. absolutely. Song of the week? What do you got? Um... Okay, I want to talk about, uh, I mean, we were talking about Bad Bunny. We're talking about Bessel Bluma. We're talking about Spanish language music. Um, we haven't talked about Ivan Cornejo. Okay. Um, Ivan Cornejo, young, maybe he's like 19, maybe he's 20 now, is uh, one of the better pure singers that are kind of moving in this space now. Uh, had a number of really good songs, a couple of interesting albums. Uh, there's a new single. I'm not sure it's better than any of the other ones. It's just the one that kind of hit me recently. So uh, what I like about Ivan Cornejo, um, you know, the songwriting is, is a lot of heartbreak. It has some of the naivete of, like, classic, wistful teen pop, but it's framed in a completely different musical idiom. And so it's this tension between the classicism and the music, musical idiom with, like, the, the raw, like, sweetness almost of the sadness of, like, a young person's sadness. Uh, and this song, I thought, really achieved the intersection of those things really well. What do you got this week? You went all depth and heart and soul, and I'm listening to Ken Carson. <laughs> Talk about, like, <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think the less said about this, the better. This is... Post words. Yeah, this is post... Post critique. Post, 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 post. Post, post, post. Um, this is from Playboy Cardi's Opium label. Ken Carson has a new album out. This song's called Jennifer's Body. Yeah, it's the one. Named... Drake, po Drake posted it. Oh, he did? He posted it on uh, his IG story. I mean, a long tale of Drake uh, throughout culture and this episode. And it's interesting because I find Ken Carson to be kind of anti-Drake in a way. But like, okay. Yeah, but like, I'm interested. Yeah. Um, I think this is based on the film Jennifer's Body, not the whole song Jennifer's Body. Uh, though I recommend uh, both. Both, yeah, sure. Um, uh, but probably the film, yeah. I mean, and based on the lyrical content, um, or just or just not connected to either, just a series of words that he found on the internet and decided to use. Sounds good, though. Let's listen to it. <sighs> It would be great if after we came back from playing the snippet of that video, like the entire set was hit, like as if a tornado yeah. had yeah. like come through it. Rage music hit Popcast Deluxe. Truly. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll figure out a way to like AI that. <laughs> um, snack. Let's get involved. Uh, oh, coming out of the Taylor Swift Eras Tour bucket. Coming out of the bucket. But it's not, it's not popcorn. You want to talk about these? I do. Uh, so uh, it was my birthday recently. Happy birthday, John. Thank you. Um, I had a party. Uh, and Charlie, Charlie Franco from Throwing Fits, uh, came through, blessed me with these, said they're one of his favorite snacks. They are from, I believe, Marks and Spencer. Uh, they're British. What are they called? These are Percy Pig gummies. Uh, as it says on the back, no artificial colors 
or flavor. There's no cool. Yeah, no, no cooler <laughs> is, is artificial. British spelling. Yes. Look, that's a high recommendation coming from Charlie. Yeah, I, I feel like oh, he's game. Beautiful. Are they? They're really cute. I really kind of like really blocked cute. it out. Like I wanted to approach them fresh. Yeah. Can we get a close up on this uh, cute little piggy? You think these are sour? Like what? Mm -mm. Maybe for you. Mm. Hmm. Delicious. It's the same um, flavor and consistency of like a um, gummy hamburger. Mm -hmm. You know. Is this part? Is the ear different? Is yeah, it juicier? Yeah, there's like the you know gummy mm -hmm. like a, mm -hmm. a gummy turtle. You know, a Haribo turtle yeah. it has the half side that's like more marshmallowy, mm -hmm. and then the regular gummy is a little bit more tart. Usually, I prefer the regular gummy on this, but I like the combo. overall. It's good. I like the combo a lot. It, it really reminds me of IKEA. Low key has great gummies. Mm -hmm. That's they actually have a some, great, they great have comparison some point. Common flavoring. I wish it was a little more flavorful. It could be a little brighter. I do like the texture. It's not kind of like a violent chew on the mouth. Yeah, it's soft. It really like no jaw pain. No, not at all. Like you like you're leaning into it. It feels coherent as like a chewing experience. I would destroy a bag of these in under 45 seconds. Nine out of ten. I'm gonna go seven. I feel like spiritually like a lot of those gummies that we you're talking about, I struggle with. Because either the texture is too intense, like it's too like <clears throat> like mortar and pestle, we're just like going in, or the flavor is so tart that I actually kind of like recoil from it. I think this is right texturally. I don't want it to be more tart. I just want the I want the flavor to be louder. Maybe you want variety, like because these are all one flavor. That's true. You, if you had three if different are, color picks, that's true. If there are, I don't know what the full product line is. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to go seven on this. Before we go, I only want to ask one question. I just want to leave it to the people to answer the question. Why is Wo Vicky in Bay Ridge? Deep. Hold on. Hold on. Let's bless them. I'm going to bless y'all. This is for y'all to split, all right? Back up. When do y'all bust that? Oh, that was aggressive. Oh, that was aggressive. That's our show. Uh, every podcast ever is at nytimes.com slash podcast. Every episode of Popcast Deluxe, which is me and Joe, which Joe just learned is on YouTube. We are filming this, if you can believe it. Tinyurl.com slash Popcast Deluxe. Email us, popcastandnytimes.com. With any questions, we will get them in our question segment. Subscribe to Popcast anywhere you get your audio and our audio video content. That's Spotify, Apple, YouTube, etc. Get in the Discord. Get in the Facebook group. Tinyurl.com slash Popcast Discord. I'm trying to get more in the Discord. TinyRL.com slash podcast Facebook. I apologize for being derelict. I'm trying to get more involved. Um, our senior producer is Sawyer Roque. Our editor is Jamie Heffitz. And of course, finally, uh, huge thanks to Pedro Rosado, Karen Gans, Nel Galogli, Leslie Davis, Pat Gunther. Uh, big assist this week from Abe Sater with the sound. Big assist. Really appreciate it. Uh, and we'll be back next week.